Okay, so uh, usually when I'm standing up here, I have something to say about the law and not about my own work, which in comparison to what gets covered in classes often strikes me as uh, sort of precious or ephemeral. So I feel compelled to start with the way that the, the guys in the car talk and by thanking you for wasting a perfectly good long So with that caveat, um, what we're talking about today is a paper uh, I wrote in uh, the field, principal field that I work in, which is National Security Law. Um, the paper is an effort to get clear on how we ought to think about a particular policy problem. And I focus on that, I focus on how we ought to think about the policy problem rather than what the right answer to the policy problem is, on the view that it's often the case in law and in public policy that there is a threshold problem of analytic frames. That is, it's not clear up front what toolkit we ought to use to think about a problem. Right? And there is an independent value in getting clear on the toolkit question, even if that in and of itself leaves more work to be done before we get to answers. So by way of introduction, what I want to do is to explain first the policy problem that motivates uh, the paper that I'll discuss today, say something about how I hope the paper contributes to thinking about the policy problem. And then say very little about uh, the specific analyses in the paper, the, the guts of the paper, um, on the assumption that those guts are relatively technical and tedious. Uh, and so I'd rather focus on the more interesting parts of the presentation. And if there are bits of what I, I say about those guts that are interesting, people can raise it and the questions are. Okay. So to motivate the problem that the paper deals with. Uh, let's talk about Ahmed Abdul Qadir Wasabi. Mr. Wasabi is a Somali national. He's alleged to be a liaison between the Somali Al Shabaab organization and Al Qaeda. He was seized in April 2011 in a boat a flat bottom down a fishing boat in the Gulf of Aden. He was transferred upon his uh, initial seizure to a US Navy vessel. Uh, the US Navy vessel is not, we don't know the location of the US Navy vessel. Uh, and then eventually, after some months of detention and interrogation, he was transferred to uh, the holding facility for the district court in the Southern District of New York for trial, a criminal trial, in an Article 3 forum. Now what's interesting about Warsami's case is that the news of his transfer to the Manhattan District Court did not promote the kind of celebration that is usually associated with news that a potentially important terrorist potentially important player in a terrorist organization has been contained. Rather, it provokes divisive debate about where it is, what forum, someone like Wasabi should be contained in. Um, the, question, um, the question of forum choice is controverted, is, is unsettled in part because there are so many options for uh, adjudicating the status of someone who is suspected of involvement in uh, terrorism. Uh, just by way of simplifying, helping us think about uh, the problem, we can divide the universe of options into roughly four quadrants by, on the one hand, whether the, uh, the forum is a civilian forum, 
right? Whether it's uh, 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 somebody within uh, either an article, uh, who has an article three stasis, or uh, some form of article one non military stasis, or a military forum, right? Whether the judges are, uh, or the adjudicators are, in the first instance, people who are uh, usually NCOs or other officers. That's one criminal versus military is one distinction. The other distinction is between those forms of detention that turn upon a finding that somebody in the past had committed one of several enumerated offenses, right, a, cr a criminal form of detention, or a form of detention that does not turn on that kind of historical finding. And as you see, there are a number of different options in these various categories, right? Um, what unites, though, all of these venues is that they are all capable of reaching judgments of some sort or another that, as a matter of law, permit for long-term detention, detention that lasts either months and perhaps years in, in uh, some, in many, most cases. What divides them, what, what distinguishes all of these different forms of uh, forum are a, a multiplicity of differences in the legal time frame, right? There are differences about personal jurisdiction rules. Does somebody have to be a citizen or not? Right? Can they be a citizen uh, and still be subjected to a particular forum? What divides them are differences about uh, jurisdictional rules. Right, does it make a difference if the person is seized here in the United States, uh, seized overseas? Is it a different case if they're seized in territorial water? Different procedural rules. Can the government uh, employ hearsay, for example, to uh, justify a detention? And different substantive rules. One of the, the grounds upon which detention is allowed, are they backward-looking or are they forward-looking? Um, the, the relevant law on all of those points is complex, and it doesn't admit of easy generalization. Indeed, I, I get paid in my day job to teach a class where we, at great length, go through uh, the, the various legal issues embedded here, uh, and I, I get to uh, write complex exams that put people to sweat. So, <laughs> The people who are in my class are like, yeah, that wasn't a nice Sorry. Um, OK, all of these modalities have been widely used since uh, September 2001. Um, although, in each case, the volume of usage has dropped off uh, severely um, in the law, about after 2002, 2003. And each of them has been proffered by some scholar or policy expert as uh, what ought to be principal tool for adjudicating the status of uh, detainees. Just to give you some sense of uh, volume and, and sort of the pace of this policy area, here's some data from uh, based upon Justice Department uh, statistics about the volume of terrorism prosecutions filed in federal courts, right? These are um, indictment numbers. Um, there's some cleaning of the, of the data that's been done by uh, an institute in Syracuse, but you can see the basic um, sharp upward trend followed by a downward trend. Right, that's, that's the, this is the Article 3 civilian criminal option. Right? Here, um, by contrast, is um, a plot at the military non-criminal option. These are uh, numbers of prisoners detained at the Guantanamo Bay naval base over time. This, note that this um, x-axis is not uh, scalar. It's not e each of the units is not uh, a unit of time. Each of the units is a, a press release by uh, the government that has contained uh, a number uh, with respect to the so detainee population in Guantanamo. Right, there's no other formal reporting on, on that. But again, you see the same kind of uh, pattern uh, emerging. Now, this kind of diversity of forum choices, 
didn't evolve through some kind of fractal planning process. It evolved instead ad hoc, evolutionarily, uh, through the government's responses and experiments um, in, um, in the post-9-11 uh, period. Right? Um, and that set of ad hoc, somewhat disorganized, certainly not rationalized policy options that the government now has in many instances, right, has, as I alluded to in the Wasami case, provided a platform for a very divisive uh, set of debates, a set of debates about forum choice. So we have, over the last couple of years, the Obama administration taking the position that, by and large, it will use a civilian criminal forum for all or almost all uh, <coughs> terrorism suspects. Um, by contrast, there are those in Congress who have taken the position that a military forum, generally the military non-criminal forum, is almost always the appropriate forum to, uh, to employ. Uh, and for, for about two years, this produced uh, policy failures. <laughs> It was very difficult for either Congress or the executive to get anything done on detainee issues because there was this fundamental disagreement on policy choice. Recently, there was some change to that stalemate that the, the, the Congress enacted in the 2012 military appropriation statute that, um, that was enacted in December. Uh, a set of provisions that bear upon forum choice, and you may have read about, but I'm happy to talk about them. Um, the, what I would say very briefly about them is that they don't resolve the question. Right? It turns out that if you add enough fudging language to a set of tax code provisions, you get something that has almost no effect. Right? So the scholarly debate on the forum choice question, the scholarly debate that has tracked and tried to help us help politicians and policymakers <laughs> think about the forum choice question has been driven by the, uh, the assumption or the idea that we, could re we should resolve the forum choice problem by looking to legal categories, right? We ought to ask whether somebody who is detained, a suspected terrorist, is either a criminal or a combatant or maybe some third category of terrorists, right? And the assumption is, is that the law provides a set of templates to fit different suspects into boxes. Um, and that those boxes provide a guide to uh, the appropriate forum that we ought to use. So those who uh, argue that somebody like Wasame, somebody who's picked up under those circumstances, is a combatant, will say, well, it's clear that one of these military forums is, is uh, appropriate, maybe even legally required. By contrast, there are, there are people who say, well, no, the law is very clear that somebody like Rosame is not a combatant, as that term is used in, in its technical meaning. Um, rather, he is somebody who is a criminal, and terrorism, they would argue, is a crime. It's historically been treated as a crime and prosecuted as such. Therefore, he belongs in this category. Right? So there's this assumption that uh, legal doctrine and legal categories provide a template for solving the forum choice question. Well, I, I think that's just wrong. Um, I think that the legal categories of competent, civilian, criminal, and terrorist are not natural kinds. They don't really exist in the world. And their boundaries turn out to be controversial on normative and empirical grounds. And, and these controversies <coughs> over the right way of drawing the categorical lines are probably irredeemable. You can't solve them, right? Although there's no likelihood of a solution any time uh, soon. Moreover, it's not clear that static categorical rules, sorting people between terrorist, criminal, combatant, are all that useful for fitting people into this career, given that we live in a world that changes very, very quickly, right? So one of the things that's happened over the past five years is that the organizational structure, if you were to draw an org chart, 
the organizational structure of Al-Qaeda has dramatically changed. It's gone from being a relatively centralized organization to being something that operates like an ideology with franchises. It's not clear how that fits into, into these pre-existing legal <coughs> models, right? So the terms of the forum choice debate, right, the idea that it can be resolved with legal categories, I think, is ultimately unsatisfying and potentially even <coughs> futile. So where do we go from there? That's the problem that the paper tries to grapple with. Uh, and what, what I want to try and do, what I, what I try to do in the paper is to say, look, is there a way of setting aside these recalcitrant normative debates about who is a criminal, who is a, a, a competent? Is there a way of thinking about the, the forum choice question that um, people with very different normative priors can profitably converge on and use to, to, as, a, as a framework for thinking about answers? And in, in an effort to develop that kind of shared framework, what, what, I, try, what I claim is basically simple. The decision about how to organize forum choice should not be conceptualized as a problem of legal law. It should be conceptualized as a problem of institutional design. And more specifically, what I, what I claim in the paper is that the pivotal institutional design question in thinking of forum choice is the question of jurisdictional redundancy. How much overlap should there be between the different uh, forums that exist for uh, trying terrorists? Now, I focus upon the idea of, of jurisdictional overlap because overlap creates options for the government. The government has a choice. And by manipulating the options that the government has, we see downstream different informational and incentive effects emerging. And so the, the basic thesis of the paper is that by focusing upon how the jurisdictional lines between these forums are drawn, and in particular how much they overlap with each other, we can focus on something that is in, within our control, right? We can focus on how our institution can use to certain incentive effects, certain uh, informational effects um, in government actors in ways that are either desirable or undesirable, right? And, and the way that the paper tries to, tries to organize thinking about this is to say, well, how does jurisdictional redundancy affect two things that we ought to care about, regardless of our priors on the debate about terrorism potential? How does it affect, first, accuracy? Right, presumably, everybody uh, concerned wants to minimize the number of false positives and the number of false negatives. Right, so we, we all ought to care about accuracy. It's relatively uncontroversial. The second thing we ought to care about is, is cost. We ought to care about whether um, the, uh, the per unit cost of detention is high or low. And we ought to care about costs that accrue not just directly to the government, but we ought to also care about externalities, externalities that affect third parties, right? So does, forum, does thinking about the forum choice uh, question in a, with a jurisdictional lens, particularly thinking about overlap, does it give us a, a set of tools for, think, uh, for so focusing upon redundant, uh, focusing upon accuracy effects and cost effects? Right. So the, the claim of the paper is that it does. Let me step back and, and, and point out some features of the world that suggest why redundancy matters. So under the current jurisdictional status quo that's up on the slide, the government has a tremendous amount of choice about where to slot somebody in, about how to adjudicate someone's status. And that choice comes in two different flavors, right? So for somebody like Warsame, there is a threshold choice of forum, right? 
the government picks the person up. The government then makes a choice between different forms, at least for Wasami. Um, this box was available. These two boxes were available. But I can make an argument that this box was available, right? So there is, a, there is, a, there is a, something we might call simultaneous redundancy currently built into the system. But there's a second form of uh, redundancy built into the current system. And we can call this sequential redundancy, right? It turns out that when you fail to uh, obtain a conviction in an Article 3 context, many of these other options are available. Right? You, you can, the government has the option of taking a second bite of the apple in many of these instances. Right? The same is true if the government tries immigration related detention and then needs to opt for some, some other option. Right? The same is true if somebody can be <coughs> initially detained uh, as an enemy combatant. Um, they can later be switched into uh, the criminal category. Right? There is a tremendous amount of not just simultaneous, but also sequential redundancy built into the system. Okay, that's the first observation. The second observation is that there's a whole gamut of reform proposals that are, that are on the table today. And most of those reform proposals involve the elimination of redundancy. So for example, if you're, um, if you're reading uh, press releases from uh, Senator Leahy or, or Representative Frank's chambers, they will argue that the Article 3 criminal process ought to be the dominant or even sole modality for adjudicating uh, terrorism status. By contrast, if you're reading uh, the press releases or the draft legislation coming out of Representative McKeown, McKeown is the chair probably of the House Armed Services Committee, or Senator Iotti's chambers, right, they will argue that this is the sole appropriate option. Right? And what they would do in both, both sides of the aisle is to boil down, is to, is to collapse currently obtaining redundancy into exclusive forum, right? To eliminate choice on the part of the government. And so th this contrast between uh, robust redundancy at present uh, and proposals that seek to extinguish that redundancy suggests that, well, this is a design margin that matters. We ought to care about redundancy in terms of what its consequences are for, um, for outcomes, outcomes like cost and uh, accuracy. So how ought we to think about that? How ought we to think about the mechanisms that link redundancy on the one hand to, um, to uh, effects that we care about, policy effects that we care about downstream? Right, so the, this is really the heart, the guts of the paper. Um, the guts of the paper is 40 single sentence pages of working through four <coughs> vectors, four mechanisms if you prefer, through which the choice about whether to have redundancy or not influences downstream outcomes. Right? And I roughly group these and set effects upon accuracy, false positives and false negative rates, effects upon systemic cost, uh, effects upon the principal agent relationship between Congress on the one hand and adjudicators and intelligence agencies on the other, and then information effects, <coughs> systemic effects, right? And my goal in working through these at a tedious and mind-numbing length in the paper, not now, the <laughs> <laughs> tedious and mind-numbing length is, is, to, is not to say, look, I know what the right answer is. Right? My, my, my goal is to say, look, at least if you're going to think about this problem, think about it in the right way. Think about it in a way that is uh, going to capture how your, your institutional design decision, in fact, influences outcomes. <laughs> so what I'm going to do by way of, of uh, concluding my remarks is, is to give you just an example of, of one of each of these or a couple of each of these, and, and, and um, so at least you have some sense of what these kind of rather nomic uh, labels uh, actually uh, encompass. Okay, so start with, the, with this first one, start with this idea about 
how, how does the existence of jurisdictional redundancy impact the rate of false positives and uh, false negatives? So just by way of example, think about um, sequential redundancy, right? The government has one bite of the apple, doesn't get that, doesn't get the outcome it wants, which is presumably detention. Then it gets the second bite of the apple, right? So this is, this is going to have interesting effects upon accuracy, right? What's likely going to happen is that the rate of false negatives, right, the number of times that the government, that somebody is, is, is not found to be detainable, is going to go down. Okay, pretty intuitive to see. Uh, less intuitive is, 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 is the point that the rate of uh, false positives is going to go up. Right, it just it follows mathematically from the, from the way forums uh, work. Right, um, and even more subtly, or, or more, maybe more interestingly, over time, the stacking of forums has a dynamic effect. It has an effect upon the legal standard that's going to be used in the second forum. Right? And the intuition here is that what's going to happen is that you're going to get a stream of cases that are basically um, uh, hard cases for the government, not easy cases for the government, going into the second forum. And assuming that the second forum has some kind of panel system over time, the combination of random draws from a pool of judges that make up the panel, make up panels, and on the one hand, a, a, a set, a distribution, a draw of uh, facts that's more pro-government is going to lead to uh, a more pro-government legal standard. Right? This is a, this is an effect that Professor Mazur has identified in the patent context. He calls it patent inflation in that context. I don't know we call it. Uh, but the point is, 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 that the, is that the interaction between redundancy on the one hand and accuracy is not a simple one, right? Even looked at statically, there are different effects on false positives and false negatives. And I'm, I'm not sure what one ought to think about, about those different effects, right? I don't know how we, that you particularly value false positives and false negatives. But, and, I, and I think legitimately people can differ about that. And even if you understand what those static effects are, you still have to think about, well, what happens when you let the system run for a while? Right? How does it change the, the legal standards uh, involved? Right? And then you also might want to think about how the existence of what, in effect, is insurance changes the behavior of uh, the first tier forum. Right? So you might imagine if the first tier forum is an Article Three court, Right? There's a happy story where the existence of some backup forum reduces the pressure on the federal judge to reach a pro-government outcome by bending the rules. And if the rules, the rules of cr constitutional criminal procedure, are trans-substantive, that is, they apply regardless of the kind of criminal offense at issue, which is true of the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, and the Sixth Amendment, right? maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it means that, that, that uh, well, we won't see twisting, talking of transubstantive Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment rules in ways that affect outcomes not just in terrorism cases, but in fact, in fact cases, criminal cases across the board. Right? Maybe that's a good thing. But maybe there's a, there's a less happy story where the existence of, insur of the insurance, like the second quarter of insurance, um, has a moral hazard effect. Maybe judges get lazy. Not clear what the empirics are, but surely we ought to think about mechanisms. Cost, systemic cost, right? So the, <coughs> an example of this is that we may want to think very differently about two uh, kinds of uh, forums that uh, might be used in a, let's say, in an emergency, right? A new terrorist attack, there's a, a need to detain some large volume. Right? We might think about those two forums very differently. If the forum already exists and serves some purpose, and you're basically scaling up, as opposed to creating something from scratch, right? The, the marginal cost of the forum is going to be very different, depending upon whether it's a question of scaling up or creation from scratch, right? In the third category, 
kind of agency in that. So one of the one of the benefits of simultaneous redundancy, right? The fact that the government has three forms that they can pick from. But one of the one of the benefits of that is that how the government selects between forums is going to reveal information about the behavior of the intelligence agencies to Congress. Why? Because picking a procedurally more robust forum is a kind of costly signaling that the agency has engaged in more hard work in, in figuring out who's to detain, rather than using a low process for right? Um, and it turns out that oversight by Congress and intelligence agencies is a very nettlesome problem, right? It's very, very hard for Congress to oversee intelligence agencies to figure out whether, you know, say the National Intelligence Estimate about Iran is right. You'll remember that from 2007. Let alone whether um, the agency is putting in the desired levels of effort um, at the granular level of detaining specific kinds of terrorists, right? So there are, there are, there are, eight, there are uh, agency slack effects from simultaneous redundancy. There may also be comp comp competition effects that, are, that, are, that also bear upon um, agency costs that are, that are interesting to think about. And then, and then finally, um, finally, there are informational effects. So the, the one that I uh, focus upon here is, is marginal deterrence, right? Um, you might think that a cost of stacking or having available multiple forums with different substantive rules, and most importantly, very different uh, sentencing regimes, right? The key difference is that is the, 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 the fact of, of a determinative, determinate sentence, right? A sentence of a given number of years, in most of the civilian contexts, as opposed to the indefinite quality of detention under the uh, enemy combatant uh, uh, detention uh, avenue. Right. Um, the, the difference or the, 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 the possibility of exposure to multiple forums uh, dampens the communicative effect of, of uh, uh, statutes that try to distinguish between different offenses in a way that uh, conduces to large, or to a, a real marginal deterrent problem. And that, that may be a real thing to worry about in the terrorism context, where it may well, I mean, not necessarily in the United States, but it may well be in other contexts that you have lots of people who are somewhat sympathetic to a terrorist organization's goal, but probably wouldn't do that much, right, with respect to those goals. And when they're told, look, you know, the way that the, the, the government uh, looks at this is, you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. You you help me by uh, putting up my cousin for a night. This is actually a, a criminal case that was tried in New York Federal Court that emerged out of facts from England. Uh, you put up my cousin for a night, and you're going to go to prison for 30 years. So you might as well strap on that suicide vest, blah, 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 right? And that's an exaggerated example, but it's, it's, not, a, it's, not, a, it's, not, a, it's not a fanciful word. Um, but, I, you know, as I wrap up, I should emphasize that I, I don't have empirics. Right? Nobody has empirics on most of these facts, right? Um, what I think is the case is that in thinking about forum choice question, in thinking about which of these venues and suspects ought to be adjudicated. Um, I think there's a good case for saying that policymakers have just been looking at the wrong things. Right? They've been using the wrong analytic toolkit to even think about the question. And, um, you know, it takes many steps to get to plausible, correct answers in my view on the hard policy questions. But the first step is using the right tools. Right? So that's what this is. Okay, let me open it up to questions. Well, uh, how many, um, I'm just curious like what the kind of like box score is for these different things, like how many military commission like prosecutions or like detention decisions have there been yeah. compared to Article 3, and like what's like the different success rates at the different um, kind of points that you put up 
Yeah, so um, let me go through a couple. Okay, uh, these are the numbers for trials, right? The, as you might expect, the conviction rate on, uh, in, in the Article 3 criminal context is very high, right? It's, up, it's north of 90. It's not, interestingly, as high as the conviction rate in non-terrorism offenses, <coughs> right? And then we can talk about this kind of an interesting question about why that's the case. But overwhelmingly, if, some, if somebody is prosecuted in the federal court, they're, they're convicted. Um, enemy combatant detention. Um, over time, there have been 772 people detained in Montana. 600 of them have been released. Um, as I read the, the, the facts, none of those people has been released as a direct consequence of a judicial order. There have been judicial orders ordering release, but the government has chosen not to appeal them and decided to release people rather than appealing them. And that's only happened in a handful of cases. Right? So, so overwhelmingly, um, the, the, the enemy combatant detentions have, have been detention for some period of time and then release. Okay? So, Query what one makes of that. There's real questions about that. Uh, you also asked about military commissions, right? That was the third. Um, so military commissions are an interesting story because they, um, from their inception in 2001, um, as many of you will know, were challenged. They were challenged constitutionally. Uh, they were challenged constitutionally because the, the initial set of commissions were created by executive order, not by statute, right? And the, uh, there were proceedings under the under the first set of commissions, but they never got very far. And those commissions were struck down by the Supreme Court in the 2006 Hamdan case. And Congress came back very quickly in 2006 and reconstituted the commissions by statute and then updated uh, uh, the commissions um, in 2009. Right, so those commissions are now ongoing. My recollection is that the commissions have generated either five or six convictions, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, and you have a set of on ongoing cases, so for example, the Al Shiri uh, case is ongoing, he's the chap accused of blowing up the coal uh, in, uh, in off, 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 off at 8 and over 2000. Uh, then you'll see the indictments coming quite soon for the quote-unquote 9-11 kind of conspiracy, right? the, the high-level people allegedly involved in planning 9-11. Um, what does that tell us? It's very hard to draw inferences from success rates because the success rate is endogenous to the government's choice of where to put somebody, right? Does that make sense? Um, and, um, you know, I think the best thing we can say is that it, maybe the lesson to be learned is, is that those procedures that are novel have, particularly the military commissions, have suffered uh, and have had very high startup costs uh, because of legal challenges and because uh, they don't have off-track rules in the way that Article 3 courts do, right? But beyond that, I, I, I think it's very hard to draw inferences from just the raw data. It almost sounds like, because they're, I mean, it sounds like terrorists everywhere are just like getting locked up no matter where you try them. So it's almost like the prosecutorial discretion is like while the action is. Well, no, they're not getting locked up uh, in every forum. So that's not, not the case with Guantanamo. Right? Everyone thinks that Guantanamo is the sort of place where people go and they never come back. Particularly, so, and people lose people, and I think that's, that's wrong. And it was particularly wrong during the Bush administration. In the last three years of the Bush administration, each year the government released precisely 120 people. Precisely. Uh, well, I don't know why it was precisely 120, but it's just. You look at the data and you're like, did they have a quota? <laughs> I thought they were against a quota. <laughs> but no, I think, I think that it's actually more complicated. <laughs> and I, but I don't fully know what to make of it. Um, yeah, and, and that's it's sort of an endemic problem in this field. We kind of know something, we don't know everything, and a lot of the data is hidden from the public. And you know, this Guantanamo data comes from like literally like pulling every single press release the Pentagon ever issued. I like hunting through the press release to see whether there was a number of them. Right? It's just it was a huge pain in the touche. So
Um, if, if the answer is to create like a new system or a new set of procedures for prosecuting uh, terrorists or supposed terrorists, is the definition for the word terrorist uh, specific enough to allow for this to happen? And then also, would so there be you, a, I'm sorry, do you think that that's my answer? Do you think that's, or is that a answer? Or is I'm that just wondering if that is like, like, you know, kind of like the recommendation. I don't know if your paper makes a recommendation on that or not. I mean, or if, if that, because that's what it kind of seemed like right now, we don't have the correct system to, to, or the tools to use to, to prosecute or to adjudicate a uh, terrorist. Yeah. And so, I mean, it seems like, well, then we would have to create something new. Um, and yeah. if we do create something yeah. new, wouldn't we fear yeah. then that these the, the rights that would otherwise be available to uh, supposed uh, terrorists can... might get lost because it's this different system specifically for terrorists? Yeah. Yeah, so I, you know, I want to be clear that my principal goal is not to uh, give an answer. <laughs> to the ultimate question of what's the effect of the forum choice. Uh, in part, I, I don't want to do that because I think that people weigh very differently um, policy outcomes here. Right? I think people have very different estimations about the numbers of terrorists out in the world. I think they have very different estimations about what the appropriate valuation of an erroneous lifetime detention locking up the wrong person for the rest of their natural lives. Some people have no, think that that's not a significant cost on people to um, and, and, and people have very different emotional reactions to the kind of harm that's inflicted by terrorism. Like Cass Sunstein has a paper about this in 2007. It's worth reading. Um, so I don't want to give an answer to that ultimate question because I think that those questions about valuation are, are difficult and are intrinsically normative. I have my own views about them, but I think that, the, so I'm, I'm sort of an odd bird in, in some respects in, in, the, in the constitutional law world, and that I think by and large, but clearly why anyone would care about what the normative views of, 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 of a lawyer slash humble person might be is. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I want to bracket that, okay? And I don't want you to walk away with the inference that I am doing something here of that kind. Okay. With that said, I, I guess I would say two further things. So I think that the right comparison to be made is not between a new system and any one of these systems. Okay? I think the right I, I think that the, 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 the right question to be asked is given that we have a multiplicity of systems at the moment. Right? We ought to look at them as a whole, as an aggregate. We ought to think about their net effect. Right? And in thinking about any reform, right, be it the reform, uh, the Senator Leahy reform, which is all Article 3, or be it the um, Senator Iotia response, which is all enemy competence detection, or be it the sort of third way, which you're alluding to, which people like uh, Glenn uh, Solomassi, who's a uh, teachers of the Naval Academy have argued, right? We also have a national security law, right? What I think you ought to ask is not, is that alternative superior to one of these particular options, but is it superior to our system as a whole, given the complex institutional effects of redundancy that we currently have? Is that a fair? Uh, and in the paper, what I, I, I'll, and I'll, just, I'll say one more thing. In the paper, what I say is, look, I think it's very, very unlikely that either of the two corner solutions, all Article 3 all the time, or all military detention all the time, I think it's very unlikely that either of those two is, is going to be socially optimized. Right? And I have a separate argument for why, why I think it's likely that it's socially optimized. It's going to be some mix. Right? And I, 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 I have to be very honest, I don't know, and I think it's very hard to know what precisely the right answer is going to be. So, do you see any salience <coughs> in the question of the jurisdictional redundancy of the debate on the targeted killing of uh, Anwar al uh, I'm sorry, I was just uh, distracted, I realized I couldn't walk over there. Um, can, can you unpack? Yes. So I'm not all on as a US citizen who uh, went to Yemen. That's what does. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a Brad Pitt movie about fly fishing in Yemen. Really? Okay, fly fishing where you can become an archive of propagandists or anything that's a thing. So I think that's a thing. Um, 
<laughs> maybe it's Brad Pitt, maybe it's somebody else. Um, yeah, so Alwar Al 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 Alwaki goes to Yemen, becomes a propagandist, issues all of these uh, online video clips. Uh, also, um, uh, will appear in these online forums and will answer questions, uh, uh, including ones that are uh, uh, posted to him by people in the US. And the allegation has been that those postings have been uh, inducements, encouragements, incitements to commit acts of violence. So, for example, Major Nidal Hassan, who was responsible for um, actually the only incident post 9 11 in the United States, in the territory of the United States. Where, uh, which you can categorize as terrorism, in which people have been killed. Right, so the Dal Sam was in touch with that world war. And um, <coughs> Awaki was killed last year, late last year, by a predator's drone. Um, and there was some debate about whether um, the US has the authority, at least outside the battlefield, where it's relatively uncontested that it does, uh, to uh, kill. U.S. citizens. Yeah. So tell me why you think that's wrong. So the uh, thought that it would be another uh, entry in the box for military non-criminal responses, target killing, and in response to that, the civilian uh, Article Three challenge uh, of that determination by uh, Alaki's family mm -hmm. uh, as, as additional options. I've also yep. uh, seen some argument that by Coming to that determination that was an appropriate action yep. was an implicit um, surrender to the view that uh, non -com or any combat in detention was the preferred form of, of response. Yeah, so, so let, me, let me frame it up to this way. What you're pointing out is that there are options that are off the grid, right? And so one option is just to kill people. <laughs> yeah, that's the option. I mean, yeah. You're giggling, like, that's funny. Like, no, it's killing people. Yeah, so one option is just to kill people, which I don't know, maybe we put over here, right? Um, another option, which is actually, I think, more uh, interesting in some ways, is, is not, is, I have extradition on here, which is transfer through a formal treaty-based mechanism to another criminal, another uh, country's criminal justice system. Right? More interesting option is, you look, you pick up somebody like Wasabi and you know, they're, they're kind of notionally in U.S. custody for a while, but you never formally say they're in U.S. custody, and at some point you just hand them over. Right? You hand them over to uh, Kenyans, right? I, I had a, a case when I was in practice involving a, a Somali-American teenager who had gone to Egypt, uh, managed to wind his way up in Somalia, gets uh, detained, seized by the Kenyans, is, in Kenyan custody for a few months, right? You know, they, they rough him up a bit, break a few teeth and stuff, eventually let him go. They didn't need to let him go. Maybe at some point they would charge him criminally. You know, I'm sure a conviction in a, in a Kenyan court is pretty easy to jet on. Like, that's another off the grid option. Yeah, so there are a lot of off the grid options, and we can keep going on that. Um, I guess what I would say is that at some point you need to draw lines around your analyst and framework uh, and try and figure out a tractable set of options. <coughs> and you're absolutely right that yeah, there are always options to take people off uh, to take people off the playing board in different ways. Um, I, I don't think that that implicitly answers the question of what the appropriate forum choice is for terrorists. Um, in, in part because I, I don't think that, that killing or sending people off to be um, you know, to have their toenails taken out or their teeth broken um, and then thrown in some deep, dark hole is, is I don't want to put my most abuse, you know, I don't want to stick my most abuse here, but I, I, I think that that's probably not a plausible, um, generally applicable policy option, right? I think it, it's, it's, it will happen in some cases, right, whatever we think of this, Cases, but I think it's probably not something that's going to be uh, a broad, broadly available challenge. So I don't think it resolves very much. And I, I, I could have done the analysis differently by including those. You're absolutely right. But it would have added another level of complexity. Right now, I have it in one of those interminable footnotes that law review editors love. 
it's Tuesday, so you can ask other questions. <laughs> <laughs> Was he in Tom? <laughs> Was it you, McGregor? Was it you, McGregor, right? Oh, okay. <laughs> that makes it all okay. <laughs> To go back to the on the grid, off the grid issue. Yeah, are you worried that um, dividing the grid categorically between the different jurisdictions yeah. may encourage people to go off the grid more, for example? Um, what's the dynamic? Can you unpack the dynamic? Um, yeah, so like, let's say that there's somebody in Yemen um, yeah. who the US military is looking at. Yeah. They say, okay, if we go in, if we pick him up, yeah. he'll end up going to a civilian court where he'll probably get off. Or the other option is we can just fire a drone missile at him um, and thereby killing him, um, which is not terribly accurate because lots of people, there's a lot of collateral damage. <clears throat> and there's really high costs in terms of um, you know, jetting out the interference. So what you're, what you're arguing is in the fact that there is a case for redundancy. Right, because right. they might say, like, okay, you can just pick him up and then yeah. have you want, So out. what you want is, in, in, in response to your hypo, is you want to have a couple of different options, right, which have slightly different procedural details, maybe substantive rules, that provide the government some leeway in some of those situations in, so as not to drive policy off the grid. Right, and, and I think that's a, that's a, that's a very good uh, it's, it's a salutary point, but I think it's one that favors some degree of redundancy. And to go back to my question, as the gentleman back, um, it, it's things like that that make me think that some degree of redundancy within the system is desirable, right? And, 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 um, and the absence of redundancy to which you're pointing, right, is probably a suboptimal policy. Thank you very much.